Hi, this is the Person, Environment, Occupation, Performance Model. I am Brenda Howard, and this is 502 Applied Occupational Theory. So we're going to look at the PEOP model using a couple of different visual models. This is the older visual model, and I actually think it's a little easier to understand uh, because it helps us look at the depiction of the person, which is counted as intrinsic factors, and the environment, which is looked at as extrinsic factors, and how they meet together in occupational performance in the middle. And this model, similar to the CMOP-E, says that the only way that the person and the environment meet is through a person's occupational performance and engagement. We also notice through this visual model the added outcomes of occupational intervention of well-being and quality of life. Notice these are also incorporated in the occupational therapy practice framework. Here is the newer visual model, and this is the one that our 2020 Cole and Tefano textbook uses. To me, this model looks a little bit like a hamburger, and if that's an easy way for you to remember it, then by all means, go right ahead. But we're looking again at the person and the environment overlapping at the point of occupational performance and participation, and then we have that, that well-being um, in the middle as well, helping us remember those outcomes. Now we notice across the top that we have the lists of what's included in person, occupation, and environment. This is a very content dense and term dense model. So we have a lot of definitions. Um, it's a little more detailed. In fact, the, the original version comes in a very large volume um, and it's something that um, you can take a look at if you're interested. Now along the side, notice that this model is also specifically written for use with persons, organizations, and populations. So this is one occupation-based model that is popular for helping us to understand how to approach organizations and populations. And in fact, that's exactly how we're going to use it today. In fact, I've found in the past that um, our OTD students have liked using this model for their capstones because they are often doing organization and population-based interventions. It also works well in the context of our Fieldwork 1D where students are completing projects for organizations um, in order to create basically program development um, for content in different areas. So it's a good model to help us fashion our thinking in those particular settings. So the focus in PEOP model is on occupational engagement. Now, much like CMOP, but of course in the center of CMOP, we have the human spirit that's also helping us focus on engagement. This model puts that performance and engagement smack dab in the center of the visual model. And the writers of this model says that this model is different because of the degree to which they define each of the concepts and emphasize each of the concepts. And that's that's really true. This is uh, definitely a more um, dense model when it comes to um, having some real meat of definitions and getting into um, breaking things down um, for us, especially in terms of the environment, at least for myself. I found that's where it really helps me. So if I have a client who has a really um, complex environmental situation that I need to break down a little bit, which is often true of organizational clients, then this model can really be helpful to us. So for occupations, it focuses on what are some valued roles and what are the tasks and activities that go into those valued roles. The authors state this is a top-down model, and what they mean by that is we start with the occupations and work down to the components. So we start with the big picture. Where do we want things to end up? What does the overall plan look like? And then we break it down into what are those component parts of um, performance skills, of um, client factors that we need to have in order to complete those occupations. Much different than our biomechanical approach that of course is bottom up where we look at the factors first and then see how they get put together for occupational performance. So one of the things that we can do by using PEOP is if we combine this top-down approach with a bottom-up approach like biomechanics, we can create a lovely 
total picture of what this client needs. So for the PEOP model, it says that a person needs to be occupationally engaged, but not always physically engaged. So a great example of this would be selecting home modification where the person isn't actually installing it themselves, but they're making decisions about what's going to go into their home. Another example would be uh, spectator sports. So spectators may not be physically performing a game, but they can watch the game and definitely be engaged in what is going on with the game. So when you think about um, occupationally engaged while not physically doing the task, think about a spectator sports, being engaged in a sports as a spectator, but also the decision making that clients can do. Um, again, um, some broad uh, abilities to apply this model with populations, communities, and organizations. So a few definitions. We have the uh, actually World Health Organization definition of occupation included here, that it's what people want or need to do. Performance is where people actually carry out those occupations. Competence is not necessarily completing the occupation, but having the ability to perform and implies the person has goal attainment. They're able to um, attain their goal. They can engage in activities that promote, again, that health and well-being, and um, it relates to um, us providing interventions for them that fits within an individual's everyday experiences. So our interventions have to be focused on what the client needs for those everyday experiences. So what does, in, does the person include? This is all the intrinsic factors. Now, I'm not gonna read you each one of these definitions, but they're all available in your textbook. So these are the different five different aspects that we look at. Physiological, psychological, cognitive, neurobehavioral, which is different from cognitive, and the spiritual aspect. And this particular model uses the words supports and barriers a lot. So are these aspects that are providing barriers or interfering with the person's performance? or does it support the person's performance? And everybody has a little bit of both going on in their life when we're looking at the person. Now the environment, this goes into much more detail than environment in, in say the PEO model or some of our other occupation-based models. So we talk about the built and natural environment, the cultural environment, also societal factors, which are bigger than social interactions. So things more like your social status, you know, or your socioeconomic status, or what are the policies and laws? We might look at this more like the institutional factors from CMOP. Then we have social interaction and social and economic systems, um, which are just kind of slightly different flavor than the societal factors. Uh, so you can read all those definitions in your text as well. Now occupations, again, much like we have with the World Federation uh, definition, uh, what people want or need to do. And this model specifically says that occupations are social, that people perform occupations directly with others or sometimes in, indirectly to prepare ourselves for being with others or even for being in relationship with ourselves. So it's social in the way that we connect with ourselves. So for example, how you complete your personal grooming, even on a day when you're not going anywhere, might speak to how, um, how you're feeling about yourself on that particular day. Um, you know, do you, do you feel more like yourself when you are clean and well-fed and ready to go than if you, um, you know, don't take care of yourself? Another aspect of the PEO model is that we have this hierarchy of occupational performance. So this is a lot like the nested concepts that we spoke about in with previous models. But in um, PEOP, we call it the doing of occupations that are within this hierarchy. So interestingly, at the earlier level of this hierarchy, we have abilities and actions. Now, abilities are the traits that people have that they may or may not be using at a particular time. So in this case, we're using the example of a person's strength. As I'm sitting here creating this video, I'm not necessarily using my strength, but I have that inherent capacity. So then actions are things that we carry out with that strength. So for example, in this example, we might lift a box. 
So we have an ability and an action. Now that action can be used for a lot of different occupations, but it's something that's available to us. Now a task is a combination of actions. So when I'm making a grocery list, I have to have a certain cognitive process that's going on. I have to check what's in my fridge, check what's in my pantry, and then decide what things I need to put on my grocery list. Uh, and then I have to have the physical ability to actually write and make that grocery list and decide what it is I'm going to get from the store. Now, if I'm going to physically go to the store, now I'm completing a portion of a goal-directed pursuit and I am grocery shopping and I might include with that the fact that I'm making a list, taking it with me to the store, and also using my strength to lift a box off the shelf and put it into my grocery cart as part of that entire occupation. Now, bigger than that, this is the one occupation-based model that says that even bigger than our occupation is our roles. And we complete a combination of occupations in order to participate in our roles. So roles are our position in society that have expected responsibilities and privileges. So in this case, if my role is home manager, the privilege is I have a house and I get to live in it, but I have expected responsibilities as part of that, including meal preparation and uh, bringing the groceries into the house. So I'm completing this occupation of grocery shopping with my tasks, abilities, and actions within the context of my role that I have that I have with these expected responsibilities. So remember, hierarchy of occupational performance goes from the lowest level of abilities and actions to the next level of tasks and occupations, and then to the highest level, which is roles. How about function and dysfunction and those continuum kinds of things that we talk about? So very simply, function is occupational performance and dysfunction is reduced occupational performance as measured by the person's assessment of that. Change happens through human agency in this model. So that's their term that they use for basic intrinsic motivation, but they use agency instead of volition or one of those other words that we've learned, human spirit. But those concepts are all incorporated into this idea of human agency, which is motivated by a person's desire to perform the occupations that they have selected within their roles. Now with assessment, when this particular model, we are looking at all aspects of the person, environment, and occupation with attention to their levels of occupational performance. Okay, so that's looking at all those different hierarchy of occupational performance. And then we have intervention, which is just simply facilitate occupational performance within whatever aspects we found uh, to be problematic for this particular person, whatever barriers we have found. Because remember, this model likes the words supports and barriers for occupational performance. What are some of the benefits of PEOP? Well, it's looking at that top-down way of picturing the factors that are influencing occupational performance, supports and barriers in both the environment and within the person. It also considers many dimensions of occupations, all of that hierarchy of performance. It takes some of our historical ideas about what is occupational therapy, incorporates them into um, kind of a more forward thinking way, and in particular looking at organizations, populations, and communities. And it's very client-centered in that way of being top down because it's looking at what occupations are important to this particular client, which again can be the person, but also organizations, populations, and communities. So PEOP doesn't have a lot of research behind it. It has a little bit, but not nearly as much as say MOHO or even CMOP. Um, PEOP though has been a great framework for thinking. So a lot of occupational therapists have just found it to be useful to help frame their thinking from an approach that stays very occupation based. And in that way, it's been found to be a very useful model. In our supplemental text, the Duncan book that I've provided the chapter for you for this week, there is application to populations, organizations, and communities. And I'm just gonna quickly walk you through these steps. We're going to be doing them in more detail in lab, but this is how PEOP says you should step-by-step -step approach doing a needs assessment, 
and an intervention for populations, organizations, and communities, which we are going to apply at the organizational level this week. And this is actually getting you ready for your field work D, so you'll be all prepped for how to use theory in that setting. So the first thing you do is conduct an environmental scan, kind of talk to the people, take a look around the area, and see what the particular needs are. And the first thing you got to do is decide, does OT have a role here? Is there an occupational need? And look at what are the goals of the population community or organization? What kind of goals do they have that they're inviting you in as a consultant to take a look at these things? Is there a match between the goals that they have and the goals that occupational therapy can provide? Do that first. Establish if there's a need and if OT can fill that need. Then we're gonna look at both the intrinsic, the client, and the extrinsic, the environmental factors that support and that might be inhibiting, causing barriers to occupational performance. Then we're gonna develop a plan. How can we take the goals, take what we've seen, supports and barriers, and implement a plan to help improve the occupational functioning of this organization according to what the client says that they need. Then you always have to cycle back and evaluate how did that go and then repeat the cycle again if you need to in order to continue intervening to get to where you need to be with this particular, um, in the case that we're gonna use this week, an organization. So in prep for lab, I'd like you to watch this video. It's about what happened in a BMW plant in Germany and how they actually carried through what could very easily be a PEOPK study. How did this organization conduct that environmental scan? How did they identify a need, identify a target goal? What kinds of intrinsic factors did they identify? What kinds of extrinsic factors did they identify that supported and also in, that provided barriers to occupational performance? What plan did they develop? How did they decide to implement that plan? And how did they evaluate the outcomes? And this is going to give us some good clues for our organizational case study that we're going to complete in lab. Thanks. See you soon.